It's October the 4th, 2022. I'm Dana Durford. I'm also known as the Nuclear Proctologist.org. We're here to gut the nuclear industry again today. Scumbag nuclear. Bags. They're completely out of control. Uh, and they have been for about 80 years. No checks and balances, no incentive not to be evil. What do you think is going to happen? There's no poll last night. We've done a 30-minute video. I was in bed an hour after the show was posted. I feel a bit better today, thank goodness. Uh, when I cough, instead of boat ribs and boat and kidneys and that aching like insane. It's just one side a little bit, so it's tolerable now compared to what it was. Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg. Uh, so anyway, I see the Steven Spielberg and I'm like, UFO, Steven Spielberg, Netflix, for goodness sakes, don't tell me. So when I translated it, I got to give up that habit. Conquers Netflix with his UFO docuseries. And there was this connotation, no, but also observations of bright lights over Fukushima nuclear power plant after 2011. And I'm sure you all seen the headlines or the connotations that Chernobyl and Fukushima, other major, major in particular is the key word, major nuclear accidents, UFOs showed up. Uh, but there's another explanation that you might want to consider is a phenomenon known as a, a flash of aurora blue light. So when you have a spontaneous chain reaction, and of course, you can have spontaneous chain reactions at these types of nuclear meltdown over and over and over and over. And they will happen high above the ground. You'll be able to see it. In fact, um, some of this was visible from Tokyo, 240 kilometers away. And you probably might remember Kevin Blanche reporting on that phenomenon over the years about it was almost like a lightning effect directly over Fukushima. This was called a, caused by massive amounts of emissions. And you have in spontaneous combustion literally in the air because you have so much neutrons and gammas and alphas and betas emissions. And neutron rays were actually measured in Tokyo. And they can't be detected by most Geiger counters. So evidence of neutron leakage at Fukushima nuclear plant from measurements of radioactive 35 sulfur in California. This was a study from 2011. I just got to set everything up here. From 2011. So the sulfur, there's a phenomenon known about in the 40s and 50s with the, and, and after of ocean detonations with nuclear weapons where you would liberate sulfur from the salt water through this high heat. And it created these spherical balls. Think of like soccer ball structures. And they were able to ingest um, hot particles like uranium, plutonium. And the biggest byproduct of the radiated fuel rods is curium isotopes. You need lead shielding 20 times thicker for, say, curium-244 than you do for plutonium isotopes. 20 times thicker lead shielding. So very energetic. Now, when it's uptaked into the sulfur spherical balls, and because they sprayed salt water on the reactors for maybe 60 days straight, and, uh, and they knew this was going to go south the second that they started doing it. And a lot of it was just a public relations stunt 
on top of that. So they made the planet almost inhabitable now because of this stunt and 80 years of it on top of that to the radioactive fallout. So you had an entire plume showing up in California, and we've got multiple studies on the sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs, which is, and there's very little known about those apparently, but of course they knew about it in the 40s and 50s, so they suggest, and they do this all the time when they don't want to have that conversation. So here you're using measurements of radioactive 35 sulfur contained in sulfur aerosols in La Jolly, California, like La Jolly nuclear plant, I guess, was measuring it. I, don't believe, I can't even remember if there is a La Jolly. It just sounds like a plant I covered multiple times for some reason. We show that nearly 4 to 10 to the power 11 neutrons per square meter leaked in Fukushima plant before March the 20th, 2011. I'd like to suggest, again, whenever I hear the word leaking, it's hard to wrap my mind around, and but you're going to hear that constantly whenever we talk about nuclear. You'll never hear, like, flowing. Well, you will. It's pretty rare, but you will hear that term. But to suggest something is leaking out of this, I, I think it's so criminal to use that terminology. It's so dishonest and deceptive and deceitful, disingenuous, which is... Um, you're talking about 100 billion, 400 billion neutrons per square meter, per square meter. It was then transported to Southern California due to the present strong prevailing westerly winds at this time. Well, that is the prevailing wind. This is the blow straight across the Pacific. And it takes about, and let me show you depictions of how that actually works. This model is based on 27 days to your left and bottom depiction. March the 22nd, you can see most of America is covered in Canada, all of Canada is covered by March the 22nd. But by April the 7th, 2011, the entire planet was covered. And we're talking four reactors have lost their inventories. And I might choke out on you guys here a few times. So. I'll try to remember to turn the volume down. And so we got slices of lemon, we got lime, we got vitamin C droplets, and ice water. And that's working pretty well to calm down my throat. And it's just going to be another show of around 30 minutes, which is very uh, bizarre for me. So, yeah, I just. I disrespect anybody who used the word leak from buildings that don't even exist. And Fukushima nuclear power plants situated in northeastern Japan, remember we're talking about Steven Spielberg again, uh, Netflix, is one of the largest nuclear power stations in the world, consisting of six boiling water reactors. Six, one of the largest in the world. One, one of the largest nuclear power stations in the world one of the largest nuclear power stations, 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 <laughs> stations in the entire world. And so you're talking about some, you know, one of the very few largest ones in the world, and, and they are completely gone. And that they had around, and there was two fuel pools at the top of each buildings, and they completely lost their inventories, which is around 10 reactor cores. And because you don't have a repository anywhere worldwide, let alone Japan, the fuel pools were stuffed to overcapacity. And um, you can't rule out anything, right? Uh, that's the problem with this event. They built it where they have a thousand earthquakes a year, and where they have a three thousand year legacy of tsunamis that go up to three hundred feet tall. In fact. If you go into the mountains, there's signs in the mountains, don't build below this area, carved in the stone from a thousand years ago. And the prevailing winds blow to the northern hemisphere right away. And that the Americans were in charge of all of these reactors being built. 
Remember, Japan was a captured country. It deserved to be captured. It's a degenerate country. It's a worthless, it's a worthless society. As far as I'm concerned, they have destroyed everybody's future. The Fukushima nuclear power plant situated in northeastern Japan is one of the largest nuclear power stations in the world, consisting of six boiling water disease factories. Three weeks subsequent to the earthquake, evidence surfaced a partial nuclear meltdown in Unit 1, 2, and 3, visible explosions in Unit 1, 2, 3, and a possible uncovering of a spent fuel pool associated with Unit 1, 3, and 4. Well, it has to be Unit 2. And remember, this is a 2011 story. It is suspected the explosion of Unit 3 may have damaged the primary containment vessel. Let's look at Unit 3. Uh, containment vessel at the very top of the building, about 100 feet above the stump that they got left there. There is no containment vessel. What's frightening is when they done this study, this would have been the pictures they were looking at. And so it was impossible to pretend that the reactor cores weren't destroyed and gone and that the fuel pools weren't gone. It was impossible. Neutron beam observed thir 13 times. Neutron beams. Now, there's different itinerations of these versions of these uh, so-called neutron beams. I'm going to be sure they're going to downplay it. The utility said it also measured utility, which is TEPCO, which is non decommissioned authority, had no idea what a nuclear meltdown was, had no right to be the purveyor of the site. Zero rights to be on that site. The entire nuclear industry we should, have, should have sacrificed a thousand nuclear scientists. And then after they died, we should have cut them open and studied them, ashed them, and sniffed the ashes for the isotopes, like they done with the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 4,000 victims they shipped to Los Alamos National Laboratory. Neutron beams observed 13 times. It also measured, like, the buildings didn't even exist anymore, and they're coming out. The cover story was right away. In the latest case of Fukushima number one plant, a criticality accident has yet to happen. I can barely wrap your mind how evil you got to be to suggest by March the 24th, when both of these reactors in particular, three and four to your left, were obviously criticality over and over and over and over and again, right? And that was quantified in 2013. Neutron beam observed 13 times. Analyst of core melt and remelt, remelt. Well, reactor three and four had lost the inventories completely right away. Yeah, there was parts that were left over, but I mean, the, inv the majority of the 10 million pounds in each building was long gone, was covering the entire planet in radioactive fire. Let me just highlight the significance of reactor three, which was a mixed oxide fuel. So that mixed oxide fuel. So the reactor core and the fuel pools were at the top of the building. And 230 counts per minute on my inspector Geiger counter. That's a $1,500 Geiger counter. And that's an evacuation zone for most nuclear power plants post Fukushima, let alone pre Fukushima. It was one quarter of that was evacuation zone. And that's gone. That's there's not an academic on the planet. There, there's not a scientist on the planet. There's not a nuclear expert. Anywhere on the entire planet didn't know that reactor core and fuel pools was gone. There's not one. There's not a single one. There's not a single professor 
Not a single nuclear university, uh, nuclear professor on the entire planet didn't know that that reactor core and the fuel pools were gone on the entire planet on day f on March the 15th, 2011. There's not a single anywhere on the entire planet in any single country didn't know that was gone. So analysts are performed at first core melt behavior unit one, two, and three. Excuse me. Again, look at what's the stump of reactor three. Does that look like a 190 foot building, a 19 story building, a 65 meter building to anybody? as well as remelt, melt again behavior, another chaotic period from 19th to the 31st of March, 2011. Zirconian steam reaction starts at a fuel cladding temperature around 1200 Kevlar and proceeds at a runaway rate above 12, uh, 1500 Kevlar. Core boil off process and meltdown in the core region, core boil off. And when you look at the pictures, none of this matters because the, the reactors had a, an excursion event, an, an, an implosion, an explosion, rather. Core water levels after the beginning of the core aren't covering. This, this, this is a hypothesis that they got there. And some of this is just for my own personal record, so I apologize for not excluding that. So you talk about the, the poundage of zirconium versus the steam. To nuclear workers, there are a few events more fearful than a criticality event. In such a scenario, the fissile material in a reactor core, be it enriched uranium plutonium, undergoes a spontaneous chain reaction, releasing a flash of aurora blue light and a surge of neutron radiation. The gamma rays, neutrons, radioactive fission products emitted during criticality are highly dangerous to humans. And so the aurora blue light. There have been 60 criticality incidences worldwide since 1945. 60, folks. This industry shouldn't exist after the first one flash of aurora blue light but because they're not honest they're the furthest thing from being honest and they show you all these models and scales but instead of the pictures because if you put the picture there then their study is a piece of junk right because you realize they're completely dishonest they're 100 percent unmitigatedly dishonest. They're criminally dishonest. And that the journals that published them, like Elsifer, Springer, and Wiley, uh, should face jail terms. The most recent occurred in Japan in 1999 at an experimental reactor in Tokai, where it's a beam of neutron, a beam of neutron, killed two people, a beam, a beam. And some people make mistake for a UFO. Hospitalized dozens of emergency workers and nearby residents and hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. What do you mean hundreds of thousands? Like 300,000, 500,000, 700,000? We're told to remain indoors for 24 hours. In other words, they should have ran away. You don't go indoors. You run away. You don't, you don't go back. You run away. Hundreds of thousands to remain indoors for 24 hours. If the beam killed two workers, then hundreds of thousands should have ran away, see? A beam a beam, a neutron beam. And the piece of the data that jumped out 
at uh, Danoki Virus, the high prevalence of the chlorine 38 isotope and a half life of 37 minutes. So it decays so rapidly to be of little long term safety concerns. Well, it's, it's a you consider it a tracer, all the other isotopes are going to be there. And it's very present troubled uh, virus. Chlorine 37 is part of a natural chlorine that is present in seawater in the form of ordinary table salt. But to form chlorine 38, however, neutrons must interact with the salt. And they did some calculations and came to the conclusion that the only possible way neutron interaction could have occurred was the presence of a transient criticality in the pockets of melted fuel in the reactor core. So there's spontaneous chain reaction going on throughout the buildings. Let me see if I can visualize that for a second. Yeah, I can kind of see where you're coming from. Why didn't he show you that picture? That would have made the story much more real, wouldn't it? The paper made clear that if a criticality action occurred at Fukushima, it could happen again. And while such a could happen again and again and again and a thousand times over, is more like it. Such a possibility poses minimal danger to Japanese citizens outside the exclusion zone. And I'm not going to get frustrated because I'm already barely able to talk here. And so it's better if I uh, if I explain why that statement is so insane and offensive. It's a very offensive statement. I was on the wrong one. Here we go. Well, everything about nuclear, you should be offended. You should be livid, in fact. And you should be indignant of what they've done and continue to do for all this time. It's humiliating that an industry is able to capture all your medias, all your universities, and then weaponize it against you so they can carry out their miserable misery machine experiments on humanity and the eight million species. So you're in real trouble. You're in incredible trouble here. And it's, it's time to make a stand. You're, you don't have an option. And every generation in the future is counting on you to make a stand. This is France's model of the radioactive fallout. This is, uh, that's day 20 right there. That's 20 days. 23 days, 25, 27 days. You get the picture. It stops at, I think, 30 days, 32 days, right? So to suggest that there's no issue outside the, the so-called exclusion zone is ludicrous. It's, it's, again, that's criminal. And you have to treat them that way. And if you don't treat them that way, then you become even more evil. Right? There's no incentive not to be evil. What do you think is going to happen to an evil industry? It's important for TEPCO to be aware of the possibility. Well, it's the equivalent of somebody going and murdering, say, 15 people on the side of the road. Everybody's seen it. Everybody's out. And you just watch this guy murder 15 people in the... The police said, well, no, he didn't murder anybody. And so a week later, he goes out and murders another seven or eight and gets thrown out of court because um, there's so many witnesses there, somebody was confused, so therefore he was a shadow of a doubt to let him go. And that goes on for a thousand years of generations of that DNA commits these crimes against humanity. That's what nuclear industry is doing to you. It is important for TEPCO to be TEPCO. Because you don't want to blame the nuclear industry, so you use TEPCO, see? You blame TEPCO instead of nuclear industry, which is who you're supposed to blame. 
It's important for Tepco to be aware of the possibility of transient criticalities when work is being done by the homeless and destitute and victims of society. Otherwise, the victims of society would be in considerable greater danger. So update Edwin Lyman from the Union of Unconcerned Scientists. Uh, th and that, that group was started up by the Manhattan Project scientists. So it was a great secrecy, right? And th this organization, like TEPCO, shouldn't even exist. They're incredibly despicable. It's a despicable organization. Everything to do with nuclear, we can't find a single organization in nuclear that has redeeming qualities. Nothing. <laughs> that was a mistake. Hang on. Got 193 counts, 202 counts per minute on my Inspector Gamma. Edwin Lyman came out and told Ecocentric, which is Time Magazine, by the way, that he is skeptical of Vera's the uh, thesis, not because the math or physics was faulty, but because he does not trust the accuracy of TEPCO reporting a high levels of um, sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs. In an email, he wrote, I think given the error they committed in Unit 2, first reporting a huge concentration of iodine-134, which wasn't actually there. So that, that was on purpose, obviously. But see, Edwin Lyman from the Union of Unconcerned Scientists would have known that picture existed, right? And, and Unit 2 was the only building that didn't look destroyed. And Unit 2, of course, You know, if the world supported a group like myself, we could litigate Edmund Lloydman and have him charged with crimes against humanity. And we can do that fairly quickly because he has no defense for the hideous crimes that he committed. So Unit 2 kind of looks like it's intact, right? Even today, that looks like it's intact. Even though we know it's not, it's completely liquefied, the fuel pools in the reactor core. Unit 4, we know. Like Dave, uh, the Fisher story is that didn't blow up. And so you're talking to a lunatic, you're on a lunatic planet. And so there was 10 times more iodine 130, oh, hang on, let me find it for you actually. So if you're gonna talk about iodine 134, and I don't know if I've ever heard anybody mention iodine 134 before. And because uh, I'm obsessed with this stuff. If anybody's going to hear tell of it, I can guarantee you uh, I'm your boy. You had a million becquerels, a square meter, over the west coast of the Xenon 133, which will burn a hole through your lung, end up in your end up in your bones and mutate the stem cells of all the kids and all the species in particular and everybody else in between. You had 20 million particles of iodine-131, but Edmund Lyman, Edwin Lyman is talking about 134. But iodine-131, there's 10 times more iodine-132 for every 131 produced. There's 30 times more iodine-133 for every iodine 131 produce, and there's 31 times more iodine-129 for every iodine-131 produced. So why was he talking about 134? Because that's the one you're not worried about. And that the 132 and 133 are nine times more effective ionizing and radiating thyroid glands than the 131 is, which is unbelievably effective. Right? And so you would do an extrapolation. And so for Lydman to come out and talk about the 134 iodine, it's heartbreaking that people like that actually exist on our planet. Xenon 133 in Washington was another separate study at 450,000 times above detection levels 
which was over a million becquels per square meter. And that the number of cancers in Japan in the first year was 865,000 extra cancers. Not everybody got health care. Not everybody was diagnosed. This was a spike of almost a million extra cancers in the first year. He's a nuclear safety expert, uh, Union of Unconcerned Scientists. And how many times have we covered his lies? 500 times maybe? 600 times or something? In the last decade? I'd be worried attributing too much significance to a single abnormalis measurement, he said. But his whole country, his country, was buried in radioactive fallout. And he knew it. And so to get a paycheck, his job is to come out and stab you in the throat so you can't protect yourself. That's his job. He, he makes a stupid paycheck by destroying your future and everybody you love and everybody in your country and every species on the planet. That's how he makes a living. And then the degenerate International Atomic Energy Agency said that Fukushima nuclear power plant may have achieved recriticality. And there's no final assessment. Achieved criticality. One can barely not scream every one of these bald-faced, deceptive, and deceitful, and dishonest assertions. These are completely dishonest, with no foundation in anything. So, so to, to claim there was no criticality when there was nothing but criticality over and over and over, and then that was buried by calling it uh, UFOs. And that was Time Magazine came out and pumped out the Union of Unconcerned Ty Scientists and Edwin Lyman, and that was March the 30th when there was no way any nuclear expert on the entire planet didn't know what I was just telling you. There was no way. <clears throat> so, you know, my take on it is the aurora blue flash, right? And not my take on it. That's actually what happened. Not UFOs. It was the same thing at Mayak, the same thing at Chernobyl, the same thing at other nuclear, major nuclear accidents. You'll see this, this, connotations over and over and over and this is put out by the industry right to um, misrepresent and, and and another one that you might not want to think about was years ago you would hear about uh, UFOs coming down and taking organs surgically removing organs from cows and just leaving the carcasses in the farmers field right and the cattle ranchers fields and that, those fields, when you go back and look at those stories, we did a number of years back, we covered a whole bunch of them. And I got a big folder here on this stuff. Uh, the majority of these fields were very close to nuclear power plants. So they had major releases. They killed the cows, removed the organs to see how bad the radioactive fallout was locally, and then blamed it on UFOs. I had the media come out and pump the story, and people would drive down to see the cows that were mutated by the UFOs. And it was a phenomenon that was happening around all nuclear power plants for decades, when it wasn't a phenomenon at all. That was the cover story. And Steven Spielberg had been recruited to perpetrate that again in a different way this time. Well, that's longer than I wanted to go. So we'll probably leave it there. I guess some good news today for everybody, for a change. When was the last time we had good news? Uh, we got the truck fixed. They put 110 kilometers on it to make sure. <laughs> <coughs> what a nightmare. An absolute disaster this has been. And I put uh, 60 kilometers on today. And about 20 of it was on dirt roads. And tomorrow I'll hook it up to the trailer, but I'm not expecting any issues. But the, 
Well, tomorrow, actually, I can't do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's my birthday. What am I saying? <coughs> I'm not doing nothing tomorrow because I can't. We got everything burnt on the stupid. Garages just wrecking everything. And um, I was down to the major point there today to look at the ocean. Uh, it's pretty big seas out there. And I'm just I'm literally heartbroken and gutted that I can't get out there and do some research. But it looks like the weather's going to change in four or five days. And so I'll be going out. Now, went to put the boat in the water last week and we couldn't get the motor to start. I charged both batteries up. The batteries, I had left the spotlight on. I had hit it with my hip or something when I was uh, putting everything away to take the boat out last week. And that's when we discovered the truck wasn't fixed at the same time, right? And so I got to I gotta try to get that motor to run. I won't be doing it tomorrow. Like I said, tomorrow's my birthday, and I'm sick to my guts, right? And so um, I will never underestimate me how desperate I want to get out and do research. But I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure I took the truck down the highway myself at about 125 kilometers an hour at one point today. And she was perfect. And uh, they did screw, somehow screw up my uh, steering pump. So I got to order a new one in. I found one on Amazon for uh, 130 which is pretty cheap. It's a reconditioned one, but that's fine, right? And so hopefully I can order that sometime in the week. And uh, the steering, like, I, who knows, right? The truck's run, the truck is running perfect. It's very, very quiet, which really surprised me how quiet the truck actually is. It sounds like a brand new truck, for goodness sakes. It's so quiet. And um, they're pretty confident they got it resolved. I won't know until I um, hook it up to the, hook the boat onto it and try to drag it up a hill. Then I'll know right away, right? But I'm pretty confident that they got it. And... Uh, I couldn't do 50 kilometers an hour in it before. Now I've done 125, so that tells me a lot. I went down a dirt road for 20 kilometers, no issue whatsoever. Ran beautiful, too, I must admit. So hopefully that's the end of that disaster. All I can do is just move on, right? And I don't know what to do with that bunch, what they got done to me and, and how they screwed me over. We didn't even need a transfer case. We didn't need the front wheel bearings. They've cost a fortune. Didn't need and can't return them. Didn't need the actuator for the transfer case. That cost a fortune. And uh, everything else, right? It's just horrifying. And they didn't charge me anything for uh, four hours of labor they done yesterday because I probably would have killed somebody if they tried to. I know I wouldn't have. I'm not healthy enough to do anything today. But I'm super happy I uh, got a stream in here and feeling a bit better. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm doing a show tomorrow night. I haven't taken a birthday off since Fukushima, right? And I don't feel like I should take a birthday off, but my throat is so stripped. So I'm quite happy just to take the day off probably. And anybody who knows me knows that's probably impossible for me to take a day off. We'll see. If I do decide to take a day off, I'll probably still put out a short video like this. Believe it or not, take some short videos. We'll see everybody tomorrow night. We'll see you on Sunday, one or the other. Hopefully we're back in business. Thank you to everybody that contributed and made it possible. Damn you, Milton Ministry. Damn your souls. You heartless, you heartless creatures. You, 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 you plague on the planet, the nuclear industry. And hugs to everybody that supported me. Bless your hearts. We'll see everybody on the next one. Have a great day. See everybody. Side. God bless you.